that kind of itself, but like, there, you know, like there's different ways of approaching it. And yeah. uh, obviously medications have been like huge. Um, yeah. And, you know, this stuff is exciting. The stuff that's coming out is very, very exciting. Um, and certainly I think like the, the biggest difference between what we have now um, Oh, here we go. The webinar has started. <laughs> yeah, that's really weird. You want me to log in? I, I mean, like it was uh, my Zoom works, obviously. Um, yeah. On it just a second ago. Let's try one more time. Hello, yeah, just... everyone joining us. Working on some tech issues. Yeah, I mean, you can try logging out, logging back in. I wonder... Um... Is this just the the code? It shouldn't be. Hello, Kirsten, Linda, Susan, Tamid. Hello, Catherine Ann. Hello. We are getting started with Dr. Rohit Sohn. Sohn's. Just a little bit of a tech issue right now. Trying to get... Uh, Dr. Sohn's Dr. Sohn's video going? Video going? Maybe. <laughs> right, let's, let me see if I uh, make co-host again. Let's see. Doesn't seem to be recognizing my camera for some reason. Yeah, it's yeah, weird. It's weird. Your... Um, It looks different to me now on my side, but I don't see a way. I don't see any other settings for like stop video, start video. Let me just try one more time, try to see if I can. Uh, as we get started here, Linda, Linda knows the drill. Linda from Dallas, no ice this week. Yay. Uh, where, are you, where are you watching from? Um, I don't remember. Did an email go out to everyone today? I don't remember if I saw a video. Like, here's your e-shadowing link. Um, because there aren't very many people here. Uh, let me promote you to panelists, Rohit. I did not get an email. No link was sent. Yeah. <clears throat> hey, look at that. We got you. All right. Excellent. All right. Um, it looks like we had a tech issue with sending out our link. Um, because there's nobody here. Uh, but we're gonna have some fun. It's being recorded, it'll it'll go out anyway. Um, but usually we have about a hundred people live here, so I'm not sure what happened. Um, it's oh, just one of those days. Rohit Stones, how are you? Is that is that pronunciation okay? Uh Rohit, but it's close Rohit. enough. Yeah, I appreciate it, Dr. Dre. Yeah. I was wondering, I, I saw the the pr pronunciation uh, phonics and I was like, I've never seen it that way. So I don't know. Rohit. All right. Yeah, perfect. Awesome. Um, I'm excited to talk with you. Bariatric surgeon, minimally invasive surgeon. Mm -hmm. um, are those two kind of intertwined these days? Like if you're a bariatric surgeon, you are an MIS doc as well, surgeon as well. No, yeah, no, no, it's a, absolutely a great question. Um, and really, you know, um, I always kind of like uh, talk to our medical students as, um, and residents as um, minimally invasive surgery um, is obviously a sh offshoot of surgery where we really consider that minimizing tissue trauma is like the absolute kind of way to do the surgery. Because like if you think about it, uh, once anesthesia is induced, uh, that's really like that first big cardiovascular hit because, you know, the induction of anesthesia, you have a major vasodilation and the heart has to respond to that. Uh, yeah. But once induction is done and maintenance anesthesia is started, uh, the patient's like remarkably stable. You can keep them that way for long periods of time. And uh, obviously the immobility and things of that nature will produce like uh, other derangements. But in general, once the patient's under maintenance anesthesia, uh, it's really all about the surgery. Um, and, you know, our main goal, our stick, our jaw is that if we can minimize that tissue trauma, uh, disrupt as like, you know, little of the vessels as possible, make sure you have perfect hemostasis, uh, then you just don't have that big release of cytokines that kind of like 
causes the traditional inflammatory response. And, you know, that's what we teach in surgery is you teach people how to operate uh, and then you have to do the perioperative care. How do you, you know, give the right amount of fluids to kind of manage all the fluid shifts and things of that nature. But with minimally invasive surgery, if you can minimize the actual tissue trauma, uh, when the patient wakes up from surgery, the body is like kind of back to hemostasis as quickly as possible. And they yeah. don't really have that, um, you know, they don't have that huge shift in fluids and things of that nature, which allows people to recover and go home and all of that stuff. Um, and nowhere is this like absolutely more pronounced than in bariatric surgery. I mean, uh, in bariatric surgery, um, these uh, patients are coming in with, you know, patients with obesity are coming in at a higher inflammatory state. Um, they obviously, their whole like dynamics and, um, you know, body dynamics make it so much di more difficult uh, to kind of induce the anesthesia, keep them under anesthesia. And then when you operate, if you're doing a big open operation, uh, you have like all sorts of things kind of going on. Um, and traditionally, open bariatric surgery patients didn't do that great. Uh, there was a high level of complications associated with it. Uh, patients during that era had to be very, very brave because, uh, you know, you're offering an, um, uh, operation, so uh, maximally invasive uh, kind of treatment uh, for a chronic disease that doesn't cause pain. Uh, lots of people yeah. walk around with obesity without any kind of issues at all. Um, so, um, you know, that was kind of the paradigm that we were working with, is that we were offering this maximally invasive operation, having issues, having complications, then minimally invasive surgery came along with laparoscopy and all that completely changed it. It was like a huge revolution there, uh, where now we can operate on people um, with obesity uh, and keeping like the, you know, complication rates down to an absolute minimum. Um, and that really, that's why MIS surgery and bariatrics is so intertwined, because uh, really with minimally invasive surgery, the most benefit you can see is in that patient population. Uh, but certainly with MIS, um, we do a lot. We do hernias. Uh, we do all sorts of solid organs in the belly. Um, you know, MIS surgery can be used with colorectal, like really anything where you want to minimize that tissue trauma. So we do kind of range a wide like variety of procedures uh, where our techniques can be useful. Um, you know, um, but um, certainly with bariatrics is where you see that big of a use. So that's why you see a lot of MIS surgeons doing bariatrics. Um, and I would say like a lot of times it is driven economically where bariatric surgery does end up being like the most, like the highest contribution margin cases that a, uh, a surgeon can do. So if you're MIS trained, uh, most of us do have a component of bariatric surgery in our practice. Yeah, I was, I was telling you before we started that some of my gen surge months during my my internship year were spent uh, talking with, interacting with MIS bariatric surgeons. And, and it was like, the one thing was like, adhesions are our enemy. And so I was like, whatever we can do to reduce adhesions, um, yeah. that's, that's what we need to do with it. And that's just what you hit on here. So that's awesome. Talk about... Um, your your uh, love of bariatric surgery and uh, minimally invasive surgery, where did that come from in your your med school and, and residency journey? No, um, no, excellent question. I didn't know I wanted to do this till much, much later um, during my general surgery, which, you know, I usually say that people that are interested in general surgery uh, go into general surgery with a completely open mind because um, it really, you know, there's just a world of possibility uh, and you can do a lot of different things with your surgical training. Um, I didn't know I wanted to do this until I was um, at the end of my third year into my fourth year of general surgery training. Uh, it was that time uh, when I was operating. Um, I absolutely knew I wanted to do something highly technical. Uh, I was like a big fan of like using my hands and like being very, very good from like a technical standpoint. Um, and the second thing I really learned about myself is that I hated complications. Uh, complications <laughs> were like, ab like, you know, it's just, they're very emotional and it's like hard to yeah. deal with them. And, you know, if you decide to go into surgery, um, you know, the old adage is that if you're not having complications, you're not operating enough. Uh, and that's probably like true at some point. Um, <laughs> But um, you know, it's like NASCAR. If you're not cheating, you're not trying. Like, I don't know if that's a similar. <laughs> I, yeah, no, it's pretty close. But I mean, it is just one of those things with surgery. I mean, you're a surgeon, you're doing a lot of cases, you're going to have complications. Yeah. Uh, and the whole point is, um, you know, number one, how do you deal with the complications? And I think that's like a huge lesson. And, um, you know, anybody that's listening to this, um, you know, how you deal with it, both from a personal level, and then obviously from like a system wide level, um, has a lot to do with like how you're going to do in your career, because if you can't deal with the complications, then like surgery may not be for you kind of deal. Um, yeah, and then yeah. the second major thing really is that, um, you know, with any kind of thing that you're doing like this, 
um, I really kind of like knew that I this is the field for me because the complication rates were like not that high. They were as, as low as you can get because every other field of surgery has some degree of complications associated with it. Like you do colorectal surgery, you're looking at like best case scenario, 10 to 15% wound infection complication rate yeah. just because of the nature of what you're dealing with. So <laughs> it's, uh, it's with, always a dirty field there. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but in my bariatrics though, you know, yeah. complication rates are like less than 5%. So it really kind of like uh, spoke to that. I really like vascular surgery in my training. I was going to go do that, but I just didn't like the radiation dosing. And I was like, I'm kind of like deathly afraid of radiation for some reason. <laughs> So it shared me away from vascular surgery, but uh, certainly, you know, uh, general surgery, all the students here are really considerate. It's a, it's a great field. And um, certainly there's a huge need for general surgeons like worldwide. So uh, anything that you could do to contribute to the cause uh, would be great and absolutely yeah. really appreciate it. How much uh, uh, with gen surge a lot, uh, obviously oncology is a, a big part of general surgery, um, different, different parts of the body were doing, doing operations for cancer. Um, not always the best outcomes in that world and complication rates, obviously through the roof still, um, how much from a bariatric standpoint, from a minimally invasive standpoint, right? It's like, oh, your gallbladder needs to come out. Great. Your symptoms are gone. You're, you're free to go and live your life. Um, the, the immediacy of satisfaction potentially for the bariatric surgeons, how much does that come into play where you see someone who's struggled with obesity their whole life, um, struggling with diabetes uh, for a long period of their life, and you do minimally invasive bariatric surgery, and obviously over time, they're losing the weight, their diabetes reverses, um, all of that fun stuff. How, how much of that outcome joy is there for you? Oh, a tremendous amount. I mean, that kind of like what keeps you going. Uh, it's funny because I've been obviously like very passionate about bariatric surgery and that comes across a lot of times. Um, and, you know, um, patients are always asking like, like, you know, how are you so passionate about this still? And really it is because of the outcomes. I mean, you know, it's interesting because like a lot of people um, sometimes when you kind of talk, especially with other doctors, um, they see kind of like the negatives of bariatric surgery, like the recidivism potentially or the complications. Uh, and they always are like, oh, wow, like how can you do an operation where people are regaining weight? Uh, but the actual rates, and I have some data to kind of show you guys later about like how that lives, uh, but it's really not the norm. I mean, the majority of patients do absolutely wonderful. Um, and the outcomes from the medical outcomes are obviously wonderful. And, you know, curing diabetes is great. I mean, like I can sit here saying that like I've cured diabetes, not just yeah. managed it, but I've actually cured it. Um, and certainly with lots of other, like, um, you know, the overall kind of, if you're looking holistically at a person's overall health, um, they do wonderful and they're doing great. But, but really the thing that really kind of motivates you uh, and anyone who's done any of this work uh, will know uh, it's really the quality of life stuff. Uh, the quality of life stuff is like, ex extremely gratifying um, when they can, you know, now start tying their own shoelaces or, you know, walk three or four extra blocks. So now their urban setting has expanded. Their whole world has now like doubled or tripled uh, what they used to be. Uh, they can take their kids to the amusement park and go on the rides with them. Yeah. Um, you know, like all of these like little stories that you hear uh, and every patient will come up with something that yeah. you have heard before. It's uh, not even, it's not even big stuff like that. It's little stuff of like, I don't feel I don't have the fear of embarrassment of going to a new place that I haven't been before, worrying about if the chairs are going to hold me, worrying about like all of the little things, not even big stuff. Yeah, like, no, I mean, going things, to Disney or like, whatever. Things that like we usually don't even think about, but it's yeah. really a big deal to these people. It's huge. Um, and, um, you know, and they, their whole the engagement, like their life completely changes. So yeah. um, it's actually uh, quite powerful stuff and certainly like highly addictive when you're doing it. Yeah. How, how much um, is there discussion going on in the bariatric world um, of need? A uh, future need of bariatric surgeons with the semiglutides, Wagovi, and and all of these medications, that the data is showing like really, really good bariatric surgery level response. Yeah, no, I mean it's exciting. Uh, it's a very, very exciting. Um, but I will say that we've been through this before. I mean, like medications have always kind of been. <laughs> fen, uh, fen, don't talk about fen, fen, please. No, no, no. Uh, <laughs> not 
that in itself, but like, there, you know, like there's different ways of approaching it. And yeah. uh, obviously medications have been like huge. Um, yeah. And, you know, this stuff is exciting. The stuff that's coming out is very, very exciting. Um, and certainly I think like the, the biggest difference between what we have now um, in this realm of GLP-1 agonists uh, versus the medications that we had before is that the side effect profile here is like much better. Uh, yeah. But um, I mean, if you look at the data carefully, uh, a lot of the stuff is still the same. I mean, if you stop any of these drugs, the weight will come right back on. So if you look at any of the curves, I was actually just at our colleagues. Um, it, it's interesting because like the politics of obesity is like very, very complicated. Um, and there's two major societies, the obesity society, uh, which is kind of like the medical angle and then ASMBS, which is kind of the surgical angle. And we used to always kind of work together. Uh, but uh, after uh -oh. the pandemic, <laughs> since we couldn't like have these meetings together, uh, we've never now like separated and the meetings are separate, which I think is like a huge disservice to like everybody yeah. that the meetings are separate. Uh, but I actually visit, I went to their meeting. I went to the medical meeting um, just because I was actually um, in there. I was there to recruit a bariatrician. Like we needed an obesity medicine uh, doctor uh, at Temple. So I was there trying to like go out for on a recruiting mission. Um, and the data there was like, great. And like a couple of things that you noted are like, you know, yes, if you stop the medicines, the weight does come back on with the vengeance. Uh, and then the second major thing is there's a lot of acclimatization, meaning that, you know, the doses that are approved now, uh, patients get used to those doses and then the yeah, weight yeah. like doesn't come down. So now you got to start upping it. And, you know, they were talking about like semaglutide and like the 7.8 milligram dosing, which is like just like really outrageous with the amount of money these medicines are. Um, so over time, like my like the reason why we were recruiting obesity medicine doctor is because like, you know, and there's a lot of people in, under my camp uh, that really think like the treatment of obesity has to be multifactorial. Yeah. Uh, you can use the drugs, uh, you can use the surgery, lifestyle modification has to be kind of like at the center of all of it. And you have to deliver all of this in a package that is, you know, um, economically viable, uh, as well as makes sense to patients uh, and kind of meets patients where they're at in their kind of like journey. Because, you know, there's some patients that are absolutely scared of surgery and don't want to have anything to do with it. And then there's on the flip side, other patients that don't want to be on chronic long-term medications and would rather have the surgery. Um, so trying to like tailor this and like individualizing the care um, is really like a comprehensive kind of program, um, I think is going to be the end result. It's going to be the goal. Uh, but every one of us is kind of working a little bit differently to get to that goal. Uh, and certainly we need more brilliant minds. We need more people <laughs> need to recruit to this cause of trying to fight obesity, because uh, it really is like the the I would say like the biggest health problem that we have uh, is obesity and it underlies and underpins all of the other medical problems. So uh, really kind of coming at this and getting the greatest minds uh, to come and help us solve this issue uh, is going to be, you know, hopefully in my career, that's really what we're going to come to. And I'm hoping at the end of my career, we actually have better answers than we have now because our answers right now are not great. Yeah. What's the the training length for, for bariatric surgery for, for MIS? Um, it's the traditional, like after a medical school, the five years of general surgery, um, you can add the two years of research if you so wish, um, because the fellowship now is getting a little competitive. Uh, but then uh, you do a fellowship program, um, which is only one year. Uh, the MIS fellowship is kind of a neat fellowship because it doesn't have like, you know, you have bariatrics, this, that, and the other. It's really like every program has a little bit of a different stint depending on the cases that they're doing and depending on the, um, you know, uh, the attendings that are there. And certainly you can get like a broad experience where you're doing like all sorts of different stuff or you can get a very focused experience like you're only doing bariatric surgery. But it's only a one-year fellowship. And after that, you're uh, ready to go. Awesome, awesome. Talk about, we haven't really defined minimally invasive surgery. Is that, uh, is that, only robots? Is that just laparoscopic surgeries? Like, what is the definition of minimally invasive? Um, you know, I'm not sure if there's like a formal definition, or I'm not aware of, but like, like I said, it's any like using techniques to minimize that tissue trauma. Uh, and that really what it comes down to is like laparoscopic and robotic surgery. Um, I do literally most of my cases robotically now, so I've kind of transitioned to robotics, uh, but that minimally invasive experience using laparoscopic surgery and things of that nature is very, very helpful, obviously, in what I do with robots, but um, really the whole goal is to just minimize that tissue trauma uh, by not creating a big incision, not creating that open incision. So I would say like most of our minimally invasive general surgery would fall under category of like, you know, any kind of laparoscopic or robotic surgery. Awesome. And I think you have some slides to share. Do you want to jump into those? Um, yeah, let me see. I can make sure I can share my screen here. 
Um, it's not a whole lot, and I'm not sure if this is exactly what you guys or your audience was looking for, uh, but it certainly is, are like my thoughts on some of this stuff. Um, yeah. And I think that um, hopefully somebody will find it helpful, if that makes sense. Yeah. Can you guys see this okay? Yeah. Well, I mean, this is kind of like the stick that I was kind of like trying to, you know, I was hoping that the audience was like in the uh, people that were like kind of looking to see all the different kind of things in uh, medicine. And I saw that like, you know, e-shadowing is about like medical students and potentially getting them interested. Um, and really um, my biggest thing was about like, you know, obesity care and like potentially how to get people involved in this kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, just because um, as I mentioned, I think it's like a major problem uh, that we need to kind of at least uh, get our minds together and look at. Um, so really, I want to just kind of like review some of the latest evidence for the bariatric procedures, uh, understand a little bit about metabolic syndrome, which is what we're trying to treat with all this, uh, and then really kind of understand the bariatric surgery process, because I think there's a lot of misconception to kind of like how the actual process works. And, you know, when you hear bariatric surgeons talk, they're just like, you think that it's like, oh, they just want to do the operation, but it's a <laughs> lot more than that. And I think like uh, using this venue to kind of maybe talk about it a little bit uh, would be helpful uh, just to at least educate the next generation about this stuff. Um, and then obviously, you know, it's definitely a shared decision making with the patient. And I kind of alluded to that a little bit before uh, and individualizing the care for the patient and kind of meeting them where they're at is really kind of an important feature in this. Uh, sorry, I think that's kind of like logging me out of my. Uh, ah, here we are. Um, as I mentioned, metabolic syndrome, this is like this is the problem. Um, and you can look at these slides and uh, really it's a huge problem. Um, I myself uh, suffer with obesity. My BMI kind of like teeters between uh, 28 to 30, uh, depending on the day or depending on what's happening. Uh, and certainly it's just a struggle for me uh, to kind of like uh, maintain my weight. Uh, and I'm a bariatric surgeon. I literally talk about this like all day long. Uh, so you could think like, you know, for a general population, how hard this really would be. Uh, and really a over a third of our population is a BMI of over 30. So they're technically considered obese. Yeah, um, yeah. Unfortunately, the cost of care is like, you know, through the roof. It's much, much higher to take care of an obese patient than a non-obese patient. And that translates to a lot of kind of dollars uh, in terms of like a national level. Um, and you can see really the problem with metabolic syndrome is that it just really kind of affects a huge host of like issues. So you have endothelial dysfunction, hypertension, insulin resistance, a prothrombotic state, a hugely a different inflammatory profile, as I mentioned. Um, and there really is just a overall comprehensive like effect uh, to the patient's uh, comprehensive health uh, when you're dealing with obesity and a, a metabolic syndrome. Um, just to kind of give you a quick talk, uh, just a quick kind of plug, um, obesity definitely is a disparate kind of like disease, meaning that it affects a whole different population. It affects it in a disparate kind of way. If you look at this, um, you know, patients, uh, people that are living below the poverty line, African-Americans, Hispanics, uh, patients that have issues with um, food insecurity, those are the patients that are most affected um, by this disease process. So, you know, the urban poor, the rural poor, um, the African-Americans, the Hispanics, like, it just is like, if you look at the numbers, um, you can see that it's like a completely like different kind of like demographic. Um, and it's just really like just unfair kind of like how this affects everybody. Um, and this is really kind of like the work that I'm doing in North Philadelphia here, uh, the population that I treat and I work with, um, it's like over 60% of the people are dealing with uh, obesity here. Uh, and it really is like a stark number. Um, and, you know, combating uh, the low socioeconomic uh, with all of the disparities that are coming in here, um, that really is hopefully going to be my life's work, uh, but certainly I can use a lot of help in this uh, just because uh, it's a pretty big problem. And certainly Philadelphia uh, is a very good representation of other urban uh, kind of blocks and uh, every city in America uh, that's dealing with all these like, you know, issues um, is dealing with obesity and I'm sure has demographics very similar to us. Uh, there's actually some cities down south where, you know, it's even worse than it is here. So um, it's really a problem that needs to be addressed. How much, uh, how much of your work, your thought process goes into um, preventing diabetes by going back to my, my camera just unfocused, uh, going back to the the five year old, the six year old, the ten year old who has some sort of aces, the the adverse childhood uh, events or experiences. Um, where they were abused in some way, they have some sort of traumatic event, 
and they don't get the therapy they need at that young age to process that. And it, we have tons of good data that shows like if your ACEs score is, is whatever, like your, your chance of, of um, obesity is skyrocketed. Your chance of, of uh, drug abuse is skyrocketed. Your chance of all of this stuff is just so much higher. Like how much work are, are you doing potentially? And then how much work do you think should be from a, a, a obesity medicine standpoint, from a bariatric surgeon standpoint, of going to the pediatricians and going like, help us. Like that's, that's the upstream. Well, I mean, it's just a resource uh, problem. Cause like the problem yeah. is so big. I mean, it really, yeah. it's just like so big. I mean, if you think of, you know, child, you mentioned childhood obesity. I mean, that's a, uh, it's a huge, huge problem. I mean, um, you know, when I did my fellowship training at Pitt, I was involved with the teen labs study. And um, really like, you know, that was bariatric surgery in teenagers who were like suffering from like, hugely like you know diabetes at 13 years old um and like not just little diabetes like bad diabetes because of obesity hypertension at 14 i mean if you think about those those kids when they turn like 25 35 that's 10 20 years of diabetes and hypertension i mean yeah. their body is a totally different style and if we could have intervened early yes that would be very very helpful and that's kind of the impetus of that whole like teen labs uh kind of thing but the problem is it's just it's too it's such a big problem and um unfortunately i i don't think that healthcare like us in healthcare we don't have the resources to kind of address it at that level we only have to address the symptoms uh once they happen so much earlier um and you know we actually have a pretty good partnership with st christopher's which has a pediatric bariatric center where we work on weight management um but like the biggest issue is that, that it's really kind of like under underfunded and there's like we don't have enough funding to get the nutritionist out uh to collect aces scores on a wide group of patients early and then yeah. give them the intervention in the the treatment that they need. Um, and I, 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 you know, certainly it falls kind of like the obesity part falls under kind of our purview, but certainly like there's a lot more work that needs to be done from like the College of Public Health and things of that nature to kind of address these kind of things early. Um, and yeah, no, when you're working with this urban population and you see all of the problems that they're going through, because, you know, the average income for a family of four in my area is 18K. So when you're working with like that kind of resources, um, certainly like we need to identify these people and we need to give them the resources that they need. Uh, but unfortunately that becomes like too big of a project for a health system. It becomes more of like a city kind of a wide project. And um, certainly I don't think that, I don't think any city in America has figured out the funding uh, to do that kind of work. Uh, and certainly if you know of anything, uh, <laughs> that's stuff our yeah. way, because I'd be happy to explore it. Um, uh. So, uh, we've, explored funding from PCORI, we've been explored funding from NIH, and we've tried to do stuff that we can, but um, it's just the volumes are just way too great. I mean, you know, our bariatric program, we have a pretty busy program and we see a lot of patients, but we're not even the tip of the iceberg. Um, the common adage is that like, um, you know, in general for the country, 1% of the patients that qualify for bariatric surgery actually have bariatric surgery. So 1% of those wow. that qualify have it. So it's a very low number. Uh, but in North Philadelphia, it's actually 0.6% of the people that qualify for bariatric surgery have bariatric surgery. So there's a disparity that exists just within the small branch of bariatric surgery. So imagine if we kind of like took this further. I mean, it just the numbers would be just overwhelming for us, I would think. Yeah. Crazy. It's a great right. question, though. And I wish yeah, there were. It, yeah. I, I mean, it just it comes down to resources and uh, mental health resources because just processing trauma and all that stuff as a kid. Um, do, doing that um, early so that we don't use I I use I use food as as a as a uh, therapy um, and so it's just a it's a struggle a lifelong struggle that's actually lifelong. my next slide you already are leaving <laughs> up but before I get to that though um, I just want to kind of like mention this quick slide just because like um, you know why is this so complicated like why uh, does a bariatric surgeon with all of the resources that I have struggle with obesity still you know what I mean it's because of this uh, I mean this system is just extremely complicated um and it's not controlled neuro neurally like it's not like a neural control like it's not like i can move my hand up and 
down. I can control my hunger. It's hormonally controlled. And as you know, you don't really have control of the hormonal system in your body. Um, and this was actually a great system for our ancestors. I mean, you know, for all those hunter and gatherers out there, uh, when you killed that gazelle, you wanted to be so <laughs> hungry uh, that you would eat every last bit of it that you could. Because if you didn't eat every last bit and you don't know when your next meal is and there's no refrigeration, um, then it would be, you know, those of us that developed or had this system to the finest were the ones that were surviving. And it worked absolutely wonderfully in like a calorie poor environment uh, where calories came and went in like very, very like different kind of things. Uh, you wanted this system in place in that environment. You wanted to basically get as hungry as possible. So you would run as fast as possible to get that gazelle. Because if you didn't like, you know, that kind of environment. But then when you put this environment into a place where you can go to McDonald's, get a super size me meal, fill you up nicely. And then once you get like completely hungry again, because you don't eat, you could just go back and have a supersizing meal again and fill yourself up again. And that's the system that's kind of like generated here. Uh, and that's what these hormones do. And obviously in this calorie rich environment, uh, this does not work out so well. And you can see why we have the trends of obesity. And um, unfortunately, like drugs are not easy for this. It's just because it's like so complicated and there's redundancies built into the system. So even the GLP-1 agonists that you see, um, they work great, uh, but uh, there are systems like in place that can even overwhelm the GLP-1 agonists, which is why we're seeing people acclimate to certain doses of GLP-1 agonists and people now starting to stop and losing weight. So you have to up it because uh, of these systems and they're very complicated and they're not easy. Uh, and some of these drugs, like, you know, when you start using them, like there are other side effects that you can come in. I mean, you know, with GLP-1 agonists, this, the nausea just like kills people. I mean, it's pretty severe in some instances and people don't really react so well to it. So, um, yeah. you know, it is kind of one of those things where you have to weigh out some of these drugs and how they work. And this is a slide that I mentioned. Um, and unfortunately, to the patient, with all of these different environmental factors kind of hitting in, it makes it very, very difficult. Um, you can see you mentioned the psychosocial aspect of it. Yeah, food is comforting. Uh, food, you know, when you're depressed, you want to reach for that tub of ice cream because it does help the situation. And uh, you're not alone in that. Um, environmental is obviously a big one. I mean, you know, Pepsi is not going to spend like a gazillion dollars on the halftime show because that advertisements don't work. I mean, they pump it into you. So you you know, when it's game day, you got to grab a beer or when it's like time for a party, you got to have the pizza. Uh, <laughs> it's all working against our patients. Um, and then, you know, there's biochemical, genetic, neurological, there's like lots of different kinds of systems at play. And unfortunately, it kind of leaves the patient a little bit stranded because uh, everybody puts the blame of obesity on the patient. Um, and that's really one of the big things that like we have to kind of dispel is that it's not really the patient's fault. It's really it's not about laziness. <laughs> it's not laziness. Yeah. And that's really kind of what it comes down to, right? It's yeah. like society wise, like we always kind of say it's the patient's fault. And yeah. um, it's not just that. And I think as healthcare providers or as future healthcare providers on this call, uh, we really need to kind of be careful about that labeling. And um, you know, hopefully kind of just make sure that we understand that the patient is dealing with a lot and there's a lot kind of going on in there. Um, and understanding that may help you better treat the patient. Um, you know, what have we tried before? I mean, high intensity lifestyle modification. These are like all the diets in the world. Um, that's really what this is all about, right? Is like you really try to modify your diet and see how things go. Um, and honestly, it's probably the basis for like any kind of treatment algorithm. So even if you're going to start them on GLP-1 agonists, you really have to make sure there's some form of a high intensity lifestyle modification is done. Um, the biggest problem with this, unfortunately, is that it's expensive um, and it's resource intensive. Um, and that's why Weight Watchers charges what they do. That's why Noom charges what it does, because uh, really, you have to follow up with the patient continuously. You have to have them log in their food and see kind of how they're doing with their food. You have to really kind of like be on top of pay, uh, people. And it really, that's why it's been really hard to commercialize uh, this process, just because um, you know, from a healthcare perspective, we just don't have the resource to deliver high intensity lifestyle modifications to all of our patients. I mean, if every primary care doctor did what's recommended for high intensity lifestyle modification, which is see patients every two weeks for the first year. And then every three months after the first year, which is like the traditional way we talk about this, they just wouldn't be able to do it. Like they, they just can't deliver that care. So we can't really depend kind of like on our system as it currently stands to deliver this kind of care, uh, which is 
why we just don't do it now. And we expect people like Weight Watchers and all these other people to try to deliver to our patients. And uh, patients do, like, you know, they have variable amounts of success with this kind of stuff. Uh, but this is what's out there for patients, most patients. Um, the data is not that bad. So um, this is actually the most recent kind of like PCORI net study. Uh, and they did high intensive lifestyle modification delivered actually by the healthcare team. Um, and they actually saw like a, you know, a certain percentage like of weight loss um, and people did okay. And they actually, they followed up for about two years, which is like a pretty good study. I think like, you know, two year follow-up in any kind of weight loss study is pretty good. Um, and patients actually kind of like held on to it. Uh, but like, obviously the biggest limitation with this study was that um, they had to continue, they had to follow that like really, really high intensity follow-up schedule and really outside of this study setting, which was like, I think like 36 clinics or something like that. Uh, they really haven't been able to kind of like expand this and like kind of offer it to like all the patients that really need it. Yeah. Um, so I, I, mean, here's, I have a question. So if you go yeah. back to the other slide, uh, and I, I've been thinking about this recently, how much do you think comes into play, right? Fat, as we know it now, at least from what I know, maybe you can correct me, is is its own little hormonal system, right? It's hor hormone tissue. And something I didn't know growing up or even through medical school, I don't think, is that like fat doesn't go away when you lose weight. It just gets smaller. So all of the hormone potential is still there. Maybe it's a little bit less active. And just the slightest, like, like feeding the, the monster, it's like, uh-oh, <laughs> wake the beast. I forgot I was here. Feed me. Like, have there been discussions of, okay, you've, you've had a ton of weight loss. Awesome. And we know that those fat cells are still in you. So maybe a quick little liposuction of like, let's, let's remove the hormone system to, to want to get back to a, a different steady state weight. Ha have there been those sorts of discussions going on? That's so funny that you mentioned that. Cause that's actually exactly the hypothesis we're working on in a study that we have here. Yeah. Uh, so we actually have partnered with um, our uh, basic scientists. Um, we have like two, we have like a Fat Lab at Temple. It's called Bella Fat Lab, run by Dr. Bella. Uh, and then we have uh, Dr. Glenn Gerhardt, who's a geneticist, um, and he's our head of microbiology and genetics. Um, and we're doing exactly that. And it's yeah. interesting how we're trying to study this, because uh, I am completely in agreement with you that fat is extremely active. It's metabolically active. Um, and I, you know, the reason why that I, like we decided to study this or like kind of come across this is that uh, when you do bariatric surgery, you notice like the higher BMIs, the fat's really, really sticky. Um, one of the main components of us to kind of like do this operation is that we get into the lesser sac. So for the medical students in here, uh, that's definitely a pimp question that you'll get asked in terms of like, you know, uh, when you're in a, a room with the bariatric surgeon, it's like, you know, what's the lesser sac and uh, what's the natural opening to the left of the sac, but uh, that left of the sac is supposed to be completely free. Uh, it's not supposed to have any attachments and you're supposed to get in there easy. Uh, but as these BMIs increase, you'll see that the fat just like causes adhesions. And there's like, it just basically is very, very sticky and everywhere. And you know that there's something going on there. Um, so what we are doing is um, we're taking samples of fat in our patients uh, when we do the bariatric surgery uh, and we're freezing them, getting them ready. Um, and we're doing the operation, the bariatric surgery. So they are going to lose a significant amount of weight, as you said. Um, but then our a significant amount of our patients after surgery get like plastic surgery, they get body contouring. So they get a paniculectomy where you remove a large amount of that fat. Uh, so we're going to compare the fat in each individual patient before and after and see if there's like a difference in the proteomics and uh, the genetics of that fat to see if there's a different expression uh, of genes. So when you do lose the weight, does the fat change? Is it different? Uh, and I think that'll kind of like, those are you know, there's not a lot of work done in this. So I can't answer your question directly because nobody yeah. really knows the answer. Uh, but certainly this is the type of work that we need to do uh, to try to figure out the answer is like, you know, we know that fat is active. We know that it's metabolically active, but in what ways and how does it impact it? Like the person systemically, uh, those are the things that we still need to elucidate all those pathways. So uh, it's an interesting question you bring up and certainly, um, you know, there's a ton of work needs to be done in this area. So even yeah, from yeah. like a societal level to all the way to the molecular level, uh, there's a uh, space <laughs> people to come in and join us. As yeah. we kind of try to figure and, this and out. It's, it's just interesting because I, I, I've always struggled with my weight. I grew up in a household where like we had free access to juices and sodas and this and that. 
And so I've always had more fat than, than other people and weight's always been a struggle for me. And, and I constantly yo-yo like other people. And I'm just, I always come back to as, as I think about it more, as I talk to more awesome people like you, I'm like, it's cause I'm not getting rid of the fat. Like, so I need to like get on a diet, lose the weight and then either go lipo it or go freeze it. And then I'm like, and then I'll be good. <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, I, you, like we, there is like nothing out there that's done like, any, like to answer that question. I mean, yeah. no one's ever even tried that before, kind of deal. So, uh, it's just like, yeah, there's just like a, a thousand questions in this field, yeah. um, and very, very few answers. Um, but I'm hoping that, like, you know, just like I said, overall interest in this as it kind of like gets better, uh, we'll be able to kind of get the funding to kind of answer some of these questions. That's cool. Um, um, anyway, uh, as I kind of mentioned, um, so here's where bariatric surgery comes in. I mean, uh, this is an old paper. Um, this is like, I think like 1997, uh, but really like it just is a, a, a paper that basically said, you know, who would have thought an operation may cure diabetes. And it's really kind of like where, uh, things like have started to kind of like go where, you know, surgery kind of came into the mix, uh, to kind of see how surgery was. And at this point now, we do a lot of surgery. I mean, we do about 250,000 procedures a year in this country, 60% uh, of them being sleeves, 17% being bypasses, and 15% revisions. I'm kind of a bypass heavy practice, and you'll see that there's variations in bariatric practices. Uh, some patients do this, that, and the other. Uh, my major thing is like reflux in the sleeve have some issues. So I tend to kind of like stir my patients to the bypass when they have those issues. Uh, but really, like it's become very, very popular. And as I kind of mentioned in the beginning of the talk, you can see, you know, before 19, 2000, uh, there weren't like there was operations being done, but not to the level of where we have them now. Uh, but then you can see kind of like right in this area here, 2001, 2003, that's the bariatric revolution. That's really kind of where we went from open to minimally invasive. 1999 was the first um, laparoscopic bypass. So it took us a couple of years to kind of like get the technique down. Uh, but once we started offering it, I mean, it's become like hugely, hugely popular. Um, and it's a great option for patients. Um in terms of the change over time, you can see um, our patients uh, became a little bit older. Uh, we started getting a little bit more men. African-American and Hispanics, although their numbers went up in terms of who gets surgery, it's still on the lower side compared to our Caucasian population. And certainly Medicaid, um, this is where, this is kind of like my, this is where I live here in this Medicaid thing. Uh, and really like, you know, trying to drive this number uh, to kind of create parity uh, with the people with commercial insurance is like kind of like a huge push uh, in terms of what I think is like, you know, where the most need is, obviously. Yeah. And and just to, just to clarify, for someone watching this who may go like, why is this something a state should pay for or Medicare should pay for, right? The, the, these aren't procedures for vanity. Like, you're curing diabetes, so no more uh, potential insulin costs or other oral medications for diabetes, uh, reduced cardiovascular risk, so you're not caring potentially for a heart attack uh, or earlier on. Like there, there are actual medical benefits that will reduce the cost of care overall, right? No, absolutely. I mean, you hit the nail on the head. I mean, um, the the best data that I can tell you or the, the biggest plug I can give you for what you just mentioned is um, what insurance approves. I mean, insurance is literally completely a cost cal calculation. Um, and the current guidelines of what insurance approves is a BMI over 40. Uh, Universally, almost yeah. every insurance uh, approves bariatric surgery. And the reason yeah. isn't because there's some altruistic thing that says, oh, if your BMI is over 40, <laughs> you should have this you know, expensive operation. It's really because they've done the math They've done the calculations, and at a BMI over 40, that patient is so high risk to get all the core morbid conditions that we talked about that it is cheaper for them to pay for the surgery to get rid of those conditions than to long-term manage those patients with that level of obesity. Um, and uh, to kind of like further make the point, uh, at a BMI of 35 to 40, so this is severe obesity, they don't approve bariatric surgery. They only approve it if you have two medical conditions that they're already paying for. So if you have, you know, diabetes and hypertension or diabetes and sleep apnea, then they'll pay for your bariatric surgery at those weights because it's an insurance calculation. Again, if you yeah. at those weights, if you already have those conditions, it's better for them to pay for it. So um, it really kind of is, um, you know, we can take a cue from the insurance about uh, how this works, but that's how the numbers work. And which is why, um, you know, Medicaid and Medicare are actually very, very good proponents of bariatric surgery. And they actually do cover, um, they do cover uh, bariatric surgery for the most part. 
uh, Obamacare was like the one where we didn't really get good coverage with bariatric surgery, but they're working on kind of correcting that now. So it was kind of like an interesting omission in the whole Obamacare thing uh, with bariatric surgery. Certainly, we were very, very upset about that as bariatric surgeons. Um, <laughs> I don't want to spend, I know that we don't have like a ton of time, so I don't want to spend a whole lot of time in it, but like, you know, this is a sleeve gastrectomy. So if you see the stomach there, uh, we basically create a long, narrow tube, uh, which we call the sleeve. Um, we size it appropriately. And really what this does is it creates restriction. So we're trying to remove the fundus and the body of the stomach, and we're leaving the antrum and the antral mechanism in place. Um, and as you guys know, the fundus and the body uh, have completely different histology than the um, uh, the fundus, uh, than the antrum. I mean, meaning the fundus in the body have a lot of elastic uh, smooth muscle and they can stretch, which is why, you know, you can go down to McDonald's and have that super size me meal because your stomach will stretch and accommodate all of that stuff. Uh, but eat, a, eat a whole large pizza all by myself during med school study hours. Oh, no, <laughs> I, I poorly do. I, those <laughs> couple of days before the any kind of exam was uh, always a nightmare in terms of my I, diet. I, gained, I think I gained 30 pounds first year of med school. Oh, wow. Yeah, no, that was I, bad. Well, I mean, like, you know, the freshman 15, like all that stuff is like all true. I mean, people do do that. And yeah. your fundus is what accommodates all that. Uh, so really the sleeve gastrectomy is a restrictor procedure and removing that part uh, is really causes that restriction. Um, and certainly the fundus in the body are also responsible for a lot of the hormones that create uh, hunger um, and help with satiety. So like removing it really kind of like helps reduce that urge. Um, the bypass is a fascinating operation. It's excellent. Uh, just to kind of give a quick history of it, it was actually originally an anti-reflux operation. Uh, it works by reducing the size of the stomach down to a small little pouch. And the reason why it worked well for uh, reflux is that because you have a small pouch, you're not creating a lot of acid that can reflux back onto the esophagus. And this anastomosis, which is called the gastro anastomosis, um, really helps drain the esophagus. So um, anytime people have esophageal issues like dysmotility or anything like that, uh, this operation works great. Um, and, you know, when we were using it for reflux, but then when we realized that if we lengthened this limb, which is called the rule limb here, uh, which is the, attached to the GJ and goes down, uh, people lost weight because it was a malabsorptive part of the operation and people weren't absorbing all the calories. So the combination of restriction and malabsorption uh, obviously created a significant amount of weight loss. Uh, and it really is like the, you know, gold standard kind of bariatric operation that we do now. Um, it was just kind of like some intraoperative images of how we create the anastomosis here. Um, in terms of our data, uh, we have great data um, in terms of like actual randomized clinical trials, which are pretty much like the highest standard uh, that you can get from a surgical perspective. Uh, there's actually 12 studies that looked at around 874 patients, and all of them kind of show the same thing, uh, a pretty huge reduction uh, in A1C um, and weight, obviously, uh, and then also hypertension. Uh, and this is Stampede trial 150. You can see the follow-up is just really good on these kind of studies. Mm -hmm. And you can see there's like a, a huge reduction of hemoglobin A1C, body mass index. Um, and then if you look at like risk factors, other risk factors, like, um, you know, cardiac risk factors, uh, you can actually see that bariatric surgery reduces. And these, this is not randomized clinical data. It's just observational data that we have from a couple of really good studies. Uh, you can see that there's a reduction in, you know, risk of heart attacks, reduction in cardiovascular events overall. Um, and then, you know, with the heart failure, this is kind of like my, the reason I put the slide up is because this is kind of where my research work is, is pretty much like, you know, heart failure and uh, bariatric surgery and weight loss and obesity. Uh, and there's really not really a lot of stuff in the literature. There's some mechanistic uh, kind of comments in the literature, uh, but certainly there's not any data. And that's really kind of the gap that I'm hoping to plug uh, with my work here. Um, you know, in terms of like, how do people do with bariatric surgery in terms of durability? I kind of alluded to this point before. Uh, this is the PCORI net bariatric study, which has a significant amount of patients, 32,000 patients. And the follow-up is great, is five years. And you can see the actual recidivism rate, like weight regain is very low. I mean, people say, you know, you kind of like think bariatric surgery is high, but it's actually very, very low. So, you know, 90 plus percent of the people you try to treat with a bypass will not only lose the weight, they'll keep it off. Uh, similar okay. to the sleeve has a little bit of a higher recidivism rate, uh, but the rates are actually overall pretty low. Um, and then if you look at safety, um, this is where I mentioned in the beginning, I don't like a lot of complications in my surgical practice and bariatric surgery certainly affords that because like our overall complication rate is usually like less than 5% in terms of all comer complications. Mm -hmm. um, and then long-term complications, yeah, there are some, um, you know, a little bit adjusted if you look at it. Uh, the need for other procedures, especially endoscopy is usually our highest, uh, but overall the, you know, long-term complication rates are pretty low. Um, 
So those are the kind of slides I had for you. And I wanted to make sure I left plenty awesome. of questions and things of that nature. Yeah. Um, if you are watching and you have a question, raise your hand. I'll get you on here to ask a question with Dr. Sones. Um, yeah, thanks for having me on again. I do appreciate it. I yeah, mean, like, okay. it's always like a good uh, to talk about this stuff and get it out there in the out there either so that like people can maybe, you know, come join us in this. Yeah. <laughs> come, come to the dark side. <laughs> Um, yeah, obviously, as, as you can say, tell, come to the right? light side. That sounds uh, like a better thing. <laughs> come to the light at uh, weight loss, wet, yeah. the light side. It's uh, <laughs> a good little pun. Hello, hello. Hello. Um, so I have a question about uh, body mass index. There's <laughs> um, a lot of like debate over whether BMI is an actual accurate predictor of health. So, <laughs> what's your opinion on that? And how do you like? I guess, <laughs> estimate whether um, your patients are truly healthy or just have a high BMI for other reasons. No, it's so, a great but, question. Be before you answer this question, I, I, I always joke. Um, so I was an exercise physiology major in, in college, uh, was a personal trainer for a couple of years before I went to med school. Best shape of my life. I finally, I was at, I, I worked at the gym. I was working out all the time, eating great. I went, uh, I did the Air Force scholarship for med school. I went, had my Air Force physical, best shape of my life. I failed because of my weight. I, I failed their BMI calculation. And I can show you pictures. Like, I was fit. <laughs> um, I had a friend and, that happened to, too. Yeah. And I was like, oh, like, I didn't, I didn't, I, I didn't even think I would <laughs> not pass this. I, I wouldn't have eaten breakfast this morning. <laughs> um, so, yeah. So, it, it has some limitations. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. Um, and I completely agree with that. I mean, um, you know, for there are populations that the BMI is not a good indicator for health. I mean, um, just, you know, the description of you is perfect. Like, you know, high performing athletes, people that are working out have a lot of muscle mass, the BMI just doesn't work. And there are better indicators of like overall health. Um, but um, the prob the BMI, the utility of the BMI, I would say, um, is the fact that it really kind of works for the majority of the population. Um, for the majority of our population, it's a pretty good estimate of overall health. So outside those realms of like people that are in like specialized kind of niches, for most of everybody else, most of the patients that you see, uh, it's a pretty good indicator of where their overall health kind of stands. Um, and it's easy to do. You just need a height and weight calculation. Whereas some of the other stuff where, you know, you're trying to measure like um, body fat percentage, for example, requires <laughs> special tools. I mean, yeah. we have that in the office. Dunk, dunking people has. in pools is not something you can do quickly. Correct. Correct. And, uh, <laughs> that's really kind of the key. And that's why the yeah. BMI just works so well for us uh, in terms of generally talking about obesity. Uh, remember, you know, we, when you think about obesity and you think about this stuff, you have to think about scaling because it's such a big, big problem. Uh, yeah. I mean, you know, when you have a population in North Philadelphia where 60% of the people are dealing with obesity, bringing them all in and dunking them into tanks, just not going to work. Um, yeah. So a BMI is the quick and dirty way of kind of doing it. Um, and certainly you have to make exceptions and you have to understand the limitations of it. Uh, but it does work for the majority of the population because most people are kind of like on that standard scale. Yeah, the the way that I've typically talked about it in the past is it's it's a good triage, very quick and dirty Correct. to to go to the next level of let's have a conversation. Are you the bodybuilder or are you someone right. who, who- Oh, that's a great way to say it, right? Yeah, that yeah. absolutely makes sense. Yeah. Who else has questions? Uh, and until someone else raises their hand, I have a question for you. Uh, I saw a um, a very small study. Um, I don't know where I, I heard about it. Um, a very small study about the effects of carbonated beverages. Unsweetened, nothing like, it had nothing to do with sweeteners that the carbonation increases ghrelin. Have you seen this study? No. That's I'll have to send it to you. Yeah. And I freaked out because I drink seltzer water all day, every day. And I'm like, and so now I, I, I walk around with my big bottle of just plain water. Ah, and and yeah. I'm like, am, See, am I- I'm a good bariatric yeah. person. Though. Am I eating more because I just drink seltzer water all day long? And there's some, it's a very I've small study. They they did it in uh, an, an animal animal model first, and then they moved to a human model with like a, it's only like an N of twenty, so it's very small. But I was like, uh oh, like what's going really on here? I wonder what the mechanism of that is. You know what I, I mean? Yeah, it'd be very interesting, be interesting to see. I'll send it to you. Yeah. 
Uh, who else has questions? We got time for probably one more. All right. Come on. Come on. Raise your hand. We'll let you unmute. Or we can let Dr. Stones go early. Nobody has questions. All right. You wild well, them with your slides. Join us, guys. Join us. Treatment stuff. This is going to be, uh, I think, like, you know, for the, I, I've got to say, for the next, like, couple of decades, I would think like us trying to figure out the problem to this is going to be exceedingly helpful, especially because it's going to become like a big worldwide thing. I mean, yeah, you know, yeah. a lot of other countries are kind of unfortunately following <laughs> down our path right Western now. Western diets. Um, yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, yeah. I, I got to like make a plug. Like in India right now, it's like a huge problem. Like a lot of people are suffering with obesity because, you know, like these companies are going in there and starting up like all the chains in there and people are just like absolutely getting like railroaded into obesity. <laughs> so uh, I think it'll be, um, you know, it's really going to be important for us to kind of like at least figure out the solution. So we're, we're definitely creating the problem that's happening right now. So yeah, yeah. Uh, I think it'll be like in everyone's best, best interest to kind of like have um at least an answer uh some some answers <laughs> some answers uh lots of interesting research data going on these these new glp1 medications hopefully some some good stuff going on there um but yeah the the bariatric world needs more docs uh and, and the minimally invasive skills are are useful in lots of places in surgery so yeah, you don't have to be a surgeon too. I mean, certainly like we need plenty of like obesity you know, docs. We need plenty of leaders. Like, so yeah. whatever talents that you have, uh, we'll take, you know what I mean? It really doesn't have to be that you have to become like this surgeon. Um, and, but certainly if you want to become a surgeon, reach out to me. Uh, Cause I do think it's like a, a really, really good space to be in. Uh, yeah. Go Eagles. Nice. I like that. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> so, but uh, yeah. Um, video game skills. Useful, not useful. I don't know. Can you guys see my Xbox? Controller? I, I can. I can see an Xbox controller back there. <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, this is in my office at work, uh, but because yeah. uh, we're on call and I don't do it during the thing. Uh, but that being said, though, um, uh, I mean, I don't know. I've always been a video gamer um, for like ever. So um, I. And I, I think I'm a pretty good surgeon. Um, so yeah, like from a, you know, spatial kind of like perspective, especially on the robot, like the robot is just playing like one giant video game that's very, very high stakes. So uh, certainly I don't think it'll hurt you. Cool, cool. Dr. Stones, thank you so much for taking some time to hang out with us today. I had a great conversation. Uh, I'll follow up with you about that uh, seltzer ghrelin study. Yeah, no, thank you, Dr. Gray. I appreciate yeah. you inviting me on and having me. This is really, yeah. uh, you know, I'm hoping that, uh, like I said, I generated at least a little bit of interest and my time here has been worth it. Oh, yeah, <laughs> Have a definitely. Great day. I appreciate yeah. it. Have a good one, everyone. Bye now. Bye.